Today I want to talk to you about the writing and thought of Ludwig Feuerbach. To understand Feuerbach, we have to understand a little bit about German idealism. And to understand classical German idealism, we have to understand a little bit about the period that is referred to as the Wormars. Now in English that means before March, that's a German term. And that is the period between 1830 and 1848. This was a very radical period. It was a period of national, liberal and democratic movements in Germany that really culminated in the March Revolution of 1848. Wormars was closely aligned to the development of classical German idealist philosophy that developed from 1780s all the way up to the 1840s. And the people associated with classical German idealist philosophy were people like Immanuel Kant, Fichte, Schelling and Hegel. Feuerbach really therefore closes this period or ends this period that is referred to as German idealist philosophy. Now to understand Feuerbach, let's go back a little bit to Hegel. You recall from my previous lectures that for Hegel, God is reason. Nature and history are God's reason in the form of matter. History is nothing other than the objectified Geist that grows in self-awareness and freedom through a dialectical contradiction. Now this idea was even supported by the German government at one point in time or till one point in time and then the German government changed and became much more conservative. There was a conservative turn. With this conservative turn, Schilling's philosophy now became much more popular or let's say not necessarily popular but was certainly supported. If on the one hand for Hegel God was reason, Schilling would argue that reason is cold. And indifferent to human suffering, like nature, nature has its laws that are completely indifferent to my suffering, to your suffering, to our suffering. This, Schilling determined, was a kind of negative philosophy, a philosophy of negation. That is, Hegel's philosophy of negation was a negative philosophy and Schelling would posit in its place a positive philosophy. In Schelling's positive philosophy, he wanted to recover a personal God, free from the confines of reason and cold logic. Schelling's conception was that God is a free will beyond reason. God created the world but is separate from it. And what we know about God is, is not obtained by reason, cannot be obtained by reason, but can only be obtained by revelation, by the revelations that we have. Now Schilling has many complex ideas, but I'm only putting one of his ideas in relation to Hegelian philosophy. The context of the time was also very, very interesting because this is the time when in Germany there was a whole set of scholars that began to study the Bible and began to critique the Bible, one of which was the Tubingen School of Biblical Studies. Now for this school, Gospels were not eyewitness accounts, but only later day adaptations of writings that had been lost. No more, they said, than four of the epistles attributed to the Apostle Paul are authentic. So they began to prove that many of the writings that we consider to be authentic are in fact forgeries. And they also developed the idea that Christianity as we know today came about as the result of an opposition between Jewish Christianity and Gentile Christianity. In other words, the Christianity that we know today in the context of Europe is not the original early Christianity of the Jewish community. One of the leaders of the Tubingen school is Ferdinand Christian Bauer who wrote a famous book, Symbol and Mythology. His other book is on Christianity in Platonism. And you can understand from this that they began to look at and examine the various influences of Plato's ideas or and specifically, more specifically, Neoplatonism on Christianity. At the culmination of this particular school comes Bruno Bauer, who is a radical rationalist, and he argues that Christianity owes more to ancient Greek philosophy, specifically to Stoicism, than it does to, to Judaism, that is Christianity as they understood it in the West in their time. He proved the influence of Philo's school, that is the Philonic school of Alexandria, and Greco-Roman philosophy on uh, Christianity, that is, the influence of Platonic thought, Neoplatonic thought, Stoic thought on Christianity. 
And therefore, he also argued, and he's probably one of the first to argue, that what we know of Jesus in the second century is a fusion of Greek ideas, Jewish ideas, and Roman theology. Jesus, as we think he existed, didn't exist. Maybe there was somebody named Jesus. But what we know of Jesus today is not the person that existed in that particular point in time. Bruno Bauer was also later associated with very important figures like Max Stirner and really encouraged Friedrich Nietzsche, etc. Another very important figure at this particular point in time is David Frederick Strauss. His book, The Life of Jesus, critically examined, published in 1835, caused a storm of controversy. His effigies were burnt, uh, he was deprived of a living, of a job, etc. Now, Strauss was also basically a rationalist. He explained miracles as misinterpretations of uh, uh, non-supernatural events. In other words, events, these events were natural events, but they were given you know, a supernatural explanation. You have to understand that at the time, there were really two sort of main understandings of, of what we consider miracles in the biblical tradition. First were the supernaturalists, that is miracles were to be entirely taken literally, were accurate and um, uh, there, was the, there was the other school which uh, believed that miracles in the New Testament were mythical addi additions. The early church developed these stories in order to present Jesus as the Messiah of the Jewish prophecy. Now in this entire intellectual cauldron steps Ludwig Feuerbach and he begins to write his books include thoughts on death and immortality towards the critique of Hegel's philosophy the essence of Christianity which came out first in 1841 and proved to be incredibly influential his most influential book he continued writing the principles of philosophy of the future the essence of faith according to Luther and so on and so forth although the rest of his works were not very influential the essence of Christianity is arguably his most influential work. Now to understand this great work, I like to do a little thought experiment. Uh, we can read through the work and I encourage you to, of course to do that. But to understand Feuerbach, to make Feuerbach comprehensible and easy to understand because he also uses a lot of Hegelian terminology making him difficult to follow. But to understand him is actually not very hard. I like to do a little thought experiment uh, if you bear with me. Close your eyes. And think about the qualities that you admire in a person. What are the qualities that you admire in a friend or in a person or in a human being? I think you probably would admire honesty, truth, justice, someone who's fair. You would admire compassion. Somebody who's not compassionate would not be a nice person. They'd be a mean person. You would admire, of course, someone's wisdom. You'd say, you know, their intelligence, their knowledge. You're in Admire someone who's courageous, who stands with their friends, you know, doesn't, is not scared of anyone or anything. You admire, therefore, strength and you admire, of course, love. Now, take all of these individual qualities, truth, justice, compassion, wisdom, courage, strength, love, and any qualities that you yourself may have added. And take these qualities to an infinite, to an absolute. Take them all the way to infinity. Are those not the qualities that we ascribe to God? Are those not the qualities that we associate with God? Asks Feuerbach. So what Feuerbach concludes from this is that worship of God is the worship of the qualities of God. Those qualities are what we worship. And those qualities are the things that we aspire to be. We as human beings aspire to be truthful, honest, courageous, wise, just and so on. The qualities themselves are divine, therefore making God divine. God would not be God if God didn't have those divine qualities. So when we worship God, Feuerbach is saying, what we are worshipping are the qualities that we associate with God. God, therefore, is nothing else than what man aspires to be. He is, so to speak, the outward project projection of man's inward nature. Everything that we hold to be pure, everything that we hold to be good in this universe, everything that we hold to be just, everything that we hold to be right, that is what God is. Religion, therefore, is the inverted consciousness of man. Why is it inverted? Because God is the principle of man's salvation, of man's good dispositions and actions. Consequently, man's own good principle and nature. 
This is a direct quote, of course, from Feuerbach. Now, this is, on the one hand, against the Hegelian notion of God. Remember, the Hegelian notion of God is simply that God is uh, reason, logic. Um, Feuerbach is saying God is not reason. God is not logic because reason and logic have no interest in human feelings, in human sufferings, in human thoughts and aspirations and dreams. Feuerbach says, and I quote, if man is to find contentment in God, he must find himself in God. So what Feuerbach is trying to say is that God is benevolent, just, wide, wise. God is understanding. God is law. God is most of all love. Our relationship to God is therefore very, very personal. It's very, very intimate because our relationship to God, our love of God is our love of the qualities, the very human qualities that we aspire to be. When religious people say, when we say that we must aspire to be closer to God, what we are really saying, therefore, is that we must aspire to be or to emulate within us the qualities of the divine. These divine qualities, truth, justice, love, compassion, wisdom, courage, all of these qualities. So this is Feuerbach's anthropological conception or essence of religion. And he counterposes this to the theological essence of religion. He says theology has misunderstood what religion really is. By theology here of course we mean the church, we could mean uh, all the priests of various religions etc. Theology has understood God as having an existence that is separate from man, that is separate and against man. God is somewhere out there or above us etc. And this gives rise to various mistaken beliefs that injures the moral sense and he says in fact poisons, destroys the divinest feelings in man, the sense of truth. The truth of religion is that religion must be understood as the anthropological essence of man. To understand the anthropological essence of man, to understand the anthropological essence of religion is to understand religion as it really is. Religion is nothing other than the aspirations of humanity. And what are those aspirations? First and foremost, and perhaps dominatingly, Feuerbach says, freedom from hunger, freedom from want, freedom from the brutality of nature, an ethical life, a just life, a good life, a happy life. And all of these things are represented in our image, our understanding, our conception of God. When man aspires to be close to God, that means that man aspires to be close to, to emulate truth, justice, compassion, wisdom, power and love. For Feuerbach, therefore, these positive values are the values that humanity aspires towards when humanity worships God. And if humanity were only to grasp and understand the anthropological essence of religion, that it's an invitation for humanity to seek truth, to seek justice, to be compassionate, to seek wisdom, to seek love, then humanity will cast off theology and will grasp what is true in religion and what religion teaches us, which is the aspirations of humanity itself. Religion, therefore, God, therefore, really is about the aspirations of humanity itself. This is a very, very positive appraisal, in my view, of religion. And I think there is some truth to it. And we will see how it lays the foundation for a humanist interpretation and understanding of religion.